Good morning and welcome once again to Digital Look TV. With us today is Angus Campbell. He is Senior Analyst at FX Pro. Angus, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. Okay, going over the recent trading situation in markets and capital markets, um, we have cable. Right now it's at about 167. It's near the top part of a multi-year trading range. The question is, Will is the Bank of England a, a tad nervous, a tad worried? If it goes up a little bit further, it doesn't seem like it would be of great import. It would not be very important, just uh, it might affect some traders. But if it broke above 169, according to the graphs, it could see a rather quick progression upwards. Yeah, I mean, I, to be honest with you, I think that uh, the overall theme uh, of, of, of our our sort of um, where we stand is, is that actually the dollar will probably tend to remain relatively strong. So I think that any further upside to sterling is possibly quite limited. In terms of the Bank of England, um, I think that it's not really, they're not necessarily too concerned about sterling. Obviously, at, at extremes, then they will become concerned. Of course, we've seen sterling dollar go to uh, two before, um, not all that long ago, uh, and it's been down to 1.4 as well. So it's, it's been in quite a broad range uh, and, and has been slowly increasing as expectations for growth in the UK have been up. You know, the Bank of England, of course, is saying that they've increased their growth forecast and things like that. That's always going to be sterling supportive. But uh, it's not really the bank's remit to, uh, they certainly won't intervene in, in the currency markets. Not even the, ver verbally. Yeah. No, uh, I mean, they may talk it down, perhaps, but actually there's been quite a lot of relief in the inflation level coming back to target. Now, of course, it's gone uh, just below there recently, and the, and the risk is to downside uh, for inflation. We could see lower inflation in particular if sterling remains elevated and if commodity prices come off uh, a little bit more. And that's been the main reason why inflation has fallen. But th there's no reason why uh, the Bank of England, if inflation does fall to, say, for example, in, uh, in what I would consider an extreme case, say 1%, mm -hmm. I don't think you would, again, see the Bank of England, uh, you know, step in to try and reduce the currency. Um, because that what they would have to do in order to do that is either further quantitative easing or cut interest rates mm -hmm. even further, when, in fact, the market is fully expecting them to raise interest rates because the economy is looking far better and I don't think in inflation will fall that low because you know we are seeing uh, better growth prospects we are seeing better unemployment data uh, and so those are supportive for prices uh, as I say the only real risk is if you do see uh, you know sustained strength in sterling and lower commodity prices I certainly don't expect the Bank of England to intervene Okay, so in the end, you do expect the current macroeconomic forecasts for a pickup in the pickup in economic growth, an improving recovery to see us through. In the yeah, I mean, I think some people may have got a little bit ahead of themselves in upping their their growth forecast, perhaps a little bit too much, because of course the recovery so far has been very much consumer led. Uh, you need to see that business investment uh, really taking hold now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, because, of course, the Bank of England has shifted its focus very much from unemployment towards a sort of broader picture mm -hmm. for the economy as a whole and the output gap. And, and, and so that's important um, to see you know, other indicators within the economy okay. uh, before they can even start to consider raising interest rates. Okay. Related very much to what happens in the United Kingdom is what happens in the Eurozone. It seems that the situation has stabilized, but there is some talk out there that the ECB has fallen behind the curve. Not by a lot, but by enough to be a bit of a worry. Where do you stand on that? Yeah, certainly. I mean, of course, if you cast yourself back six months or so, you know, the Eurozone data was poor and France was uh, just about to go into recession again, and it's still teetering on that. We had some mm. poor uh, data from France and Germany and the Eurozone this morning in the form of the PMI numbers. And so, inflation as well. And inflation was lower, exactly. So we're definitely not out of the woods yet. The pressure is um, being applied to the Eurozone because, of course, we are seeing the Euro uh, investors are embracing Euro risk because they've seen the picture looks a lot brighter. We've seen bond yields 
really, really fall in the likes of Greece, Spain, Portugal. These countries are coming out, even some of these countries are coming out of their bailout programs. So all that helps with confidence, investor sentiment. That's why the euro has been going so much higher as people embrace a bit more risk premier in, 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 in the eurozone. So the, the, the ECB is having to battle a still a really quite weak economy and a rising interest rate. So it, 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 there is still the consensus that they're going to have to be accommodative at some point. And the only real way they can do that is by cutting interest rates. Now, I don't foresee any cut in interest rates particularly soon. Mm. I mean, there may be at uh, some point later on this year. Um, any other sort of form of quantitative easing from the ECB, of course, is impossible to tell whether they are legally able to do it or, or be whether they will go ahead and, and do such a thing. Because, of course, the OMT, which uh, was so famously um, brought about when Draghi said he'd do anything he would take to save the euro, of course, is still you know, wrapped up in legal wranglings as to whether they're actually allowed to do it or not. So there are still some risks surrounding the situation in the eurozone. Yes, very much so. Um, Specifically Italy. There's been a, well, a change, in, change of government. There isn't a new government in place yet. But politics in Europe can be complex, in the Mediterranean even more so. Yeah, and there's some political risk coming out because, of course, you've got the European Parliament elections in May. Uh, and it will be interesting there to see uh, just how um, anti-European any of the voting is. And, you know, of course, you mentioned Italy, and that's an important one as well, because Renzi has come in on a wave of optimism, and we've seen this before, and really what the country needs is the structural changes that he has, uh, has, has mentioned, Supposedly. employment changes, exactly. So um, that, that, that's pretty important for the Italian uh, economy as a whole, for it to become more competitive. Of course, when he's in power, the question is, will he have to water down these changes to get them through? And what support will he rely on uh, in order to get what he needs in order to make these changes? And so, you know, you may say one thing, and, and, and often is the case, in order to actually get what uh, they've been saying originally, it may mean complete, maybe something completely different to what actually is passed through. So, you know, some of his policies may well be watered down. So we watch this space with great interest and hopefully he'll be able to implement some of the ideas that he's had. Okay, just in case he doesn't save the day, havens, gold. Uh, there's been a rally over the last couple of weeks, last couple of months. Just that, a uh, rally based on haven flows. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's based on haven flows primarily. And a lot of people are sort of, you know, uh, with, with gold, you're either in uh, the bear camp or, or the bull camp. I mean, I, I actually tend to be so slightly on the fence, but maybe maybe towards the bearish camp because the, the, the gold bubble is probably most likely burst. You know, you, you, you don't see it as such a, a safe haven asset anymore. Um, so many people were heavily long gold and, and way over invested in it. Uh, the Fed is tapering and mm. the dollar is likely to strengthen. So that all puts pressure on gold. We saw that, of course, last year in particular, which is why gold suffered um, such uh, a big decline. Um, but so far this year, uh, that, that dollar strength hasn't really materialized yet. You've seen a bit of um, worry in emerging markets. The global growth picture is looking a little bit uncertain. And so that sort of safe haven uh, feel to gold has come back somewhat. It's had a very good bounce, but I'm not sure that necessarily it's, it's sustainable. Okay, we'll go on to the F Federal Reserve in a minute. But as far as possible risks, possible triggers for haven flows, China, Turkey. China, I know, for example, Barclays Research just last week was saying that the risk of a liquidity crisis in China this year is a major risk. Well, of course it is. And the, the, you know, there, was, there was a credit crunch you know, in, in the latter part of 2013. There was concerns that that was going to really knock the Chinese banking system uh, out of the equation, and they would suffer, you know, sort of uh, a, a crisis similar to the eurozone. Obviously, not to the sort of sovereign debt uh, type uh, extremes, but um, you know, certainly a liquidity crisis is is possible. Um, the Chinese uh, have built up a huge mountain of debt as well, so um, 
the economy is slowing at the same time. We've already seen a reduction in liquidity across emerging economies, uh, and, and that has seen a bit of that safe haven, as we mentioned. Gold has got that safe haven alert to it again. Investors have moved back into the dollar to some degree because the, 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 um, the bond market has risen quite a bit there. Ten-year Treasury yields have retreated quite significantly from above 3% recently. And so money is flowing out of China. And if you see the data like we saw overnight where the manufacturing uh, has softened, uh, it doesn't indicate necessarily any hard landing as yet. Even though China, of course, is still very, very reliant on its manufacturing sector, and that manufacturing uh, sector is is contracting according to the PMIs, um, you'd have to probably see a lot, lot weaker. But the, the, the economy is slowing, and and um, and there's no question of that. So, so you will see a withdrawal of uh, liquidity. A liquidity crisis, however, I'm not convinced. Okay, emerging markets. Um, there do not seem to be fears at the general level for emerging markets as a class, but for specific countries that could still perhaps lead to some nervousness amongst investors. Turkey is one case. Also recently, Russia. I believe there are some Russians there with the situation in Ukraine and so on. Well, yes. I mean, How do you see that? Yeah, certainly the, the, the situation with the emerging markets obviously was the real focus was uh, all those emerging economies with big current account deficits, they were the danger zones, they were big flashing lights warning. In fact, when the uh, s- emerging markets, not a crisis, the emerging markets sort of wobble, when it really inflamed recently, it was actually uh, those, uh, those countries with the current, big current account deficits that didn't suffer quite so much because they'd already suffered uh, some negative sentiment mm-hmm. in, in the interim uh, well, but, but ahead of then. Uh, and, and things are different today to previous emerging market crises because their currencies are far more free-floating, they can act, and you've already seen uh, the central banks, in particular Turkey, act very, very swiftly, and that seems to have settled uh, the, the, the um, calm nerves. The, this calm the nerves. Uh, things aren't don't look quite so bad, but I think that obviously one has to keep an eye on these things because, you know, you are seeing uh, the, the the growth in these emerging markets is receding. It's it's not in recession, but I mean, they, you know, they, they are getting they're growing slower, and if you're tightening monetary policy at a time that you, your economy is slowing. Uh, they're, they're, that's a counterproductive move. So um, we may see some re-emergence um, because if they're tightening policy and their economies are slowing, it's only going to compound that mm-hmm. slowing. So, so things may re-emerge, not necessarily from a, a, a sort of currency crisis or a, or a, or a, you know, a, a full-blown crisis, but certainly a growth problem. Uh, will we'll bring those economies probably back to the, the fore. Okay. And then finally, um, perhaps the major driver of moves in the FX space, the United States Federal Reserve. Uh, we had the minutes last night. On the whole, they seem relatively dovish, but there was a small group, correct me if I'm wrong, that apparently wanted to debate the possibility of a rate rise towards year end. Much ado about nothing, or well, I don't think they're, they're, of course, there's always hawks in the Federal Reserve, and there's no reason why they shouldn't say we must look at rate rises. The economy is looking strong, it's in a very good condition, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's recovered exceptionally well. So in that instance, what you do is you withdraw monetary policy and you raise rates. So you're always going to get hawks, but I think they're, in the, they're, they're certainly in the minority. They're not going to get what they want. The Federal Reserve is trying to be perfectly clear in communicating, and it's very important they do that to, to, to mm-hmm. you know, ensure that investors don't become nervous and create uncertainty. They want to ensure that investors know that tapering is happen, happening. The market is absorbing that and, it, and appreciates that, that tapering is happening. So at the end of the year, uh, the taper should have ended. But most importantly, when that ends, uh, and it may not be at the uh, you know this year. It may continue into next year, possibly, but probably not for very long. But when tapering ends, of course, it means that it doesn't necessarily mean interest rates will rise straight away. There will be again a, a long period. You know, the the message, the key message is 
rates are here uh, at low levels and they're here to stay. I see. You did mention to me before the interview one thing which I found also very interesting, the possibility of a small pause in tapering at some point during the year. Data dependent. I mean, they, they made clear as well, because, you know, you've, you've got to sort of be able to react uh, in every circumstance, and they're sort of slightly hedging their bets a bit. And I think the minutes just showed that the data recently has been weak, weather um, affected, and they would expect data to, to bounce back, improve um, as conditions get better. So the economy should have suffered a small blip uh, and then should come back. Now, if, if the data isn't picking up again, mm. then they will have to adjust accordingly. And, and I think that there is no reason why they can't uh, pause tapering for a, a period of time. And if, but if they do, they obviously have to communicate that clearly to the market. They wouldn't want to make it any surprise. Their forward guidance has to factor that in. Uh, so there, there is, you know, you never say never in, in these situations. You have to appreciate that if the data does slow, then maybe tapering is put on pause for a little while, um, and that will obviously support gold, that will s sort of uh, weaken the dollar, but you, you've just got to factor the risk of that happening in uh, to some degree. Okay, and lastly, before we leave, if I may ask you please, for a trading recommendation. Yeah, so uh, in my opinion, I, uh, I feel that the dollar still uh, is, is potentially a favorable place to be because uh, you know it's my view that that, that, that tapering will continue uh, in the normal course as the Fed has communicated and that should on the whole remain quite positive for the dollar uh, and when you compare that to the likes of the euro and sterling I think sterling remains very well supported and underpinned I don't foresee huge appreciation in sterling okay. uh, and I certainly don't see a huge appreciation in the euro because the eurozone, as we've discussed, is suffering from uh, you know poor data. Uh, I think the the ECB will at some point have to be a little bit more accommodative, uh, and so all these factors tend to sort of point towards uh, not necessarily a dollar that's going to race away and, and and head higher significantly, but remains more supportive than than the other currencies. I see. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. We do hope you will join us again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that's all from us here at Digital Look TV for today with Angus Campbell, Senior Analyst at FX Pro. Thank you very much for joining us again.